Now, I'm very careful about judging another man's servant because Dr. Schofield is certainly a great, great man of God, and the Schofield Bible has been a great blessing to many, many people, including myself. And I want to say that overall, the uh, Schofield notes have been a great help. And for the most part, the Schofield notes are a great blessing. And I think right on target. And um, <clears throat> his position on the premillennial return of Christ, he and Larkin especially have saved uh, two to three generations from going into error. Also, his position on Israel has kept uh, two or three generations now from going into error, especially in the area of postmillennialism and also uh, in the area of, uh, of the uh, uh, transfer uh, position of uh, Israel being the church. My, uh, how, uh, almost uh, the entire Christendom has gone into the air of uh, transferring all of the uh, blessings uh, that has been promised to Israel now to the church, and they've spiritualized uh, all of those promises. And uh, what a tragic thing uh, that is. And so uh, we want to give credit uh, to Schofield for that. But if you have a Schofield Bible and read his notes here on the book of James, uh, it's, it's terrible what he says. In fact, it's slanderous. Uh, let me read to you what he says uh, concerning uh, James. It says here, uh, James called the just, uh, mentioned by Paul with Cephas and John, as pillars in the church at Jerusalem. It says he seems to have been, as a religious man, austere, legal, ceremonial. And then he quotes uh, as his uh, proof, Acts 21, 18 to 24. He gives that text. We won't take time to read that this morning. Now let me go back over that just for a moment. He says that James, uh, remember the three, uh, Peter, James, and John, okay, He seems to have been, as a religious man, austere, legal, ceremonial. Well, that's slanderous. That's slanderous. He slanders the Apostle James. What right does he have to say that about the Apostle James? No, no wonder people uh, say uh, uh, concerning pastors that are trying to take a stand on uh, uh, standards and and uh, uh, trying to draw the line on on uh, 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 conduct, Christian conduct. Well, he he he's narrow-minded, so on and so forth. But what do you do with scriptures? Uh, like the Lord Jesus himself said, narrow is the way, straight is the gate. Maybe the Lord Jesus is, maybe you could say the same thing about the Lord Jesus. He says the theme of the book of James is then religion, outward religious service as the expression of, and proof of faith. The proof of our faith. 
Now I'm going to try to show in this study that we're not going to get that to we're not going to get into that into this today. That will be our next study and when we get into chapter two. But I'm going to try to show you that this is not correct. But I taught this. I taught this myself. That James chapter two. When James said, I will show you my faith, show me your faith without your works, and I will show you my faith by my works, I taught the same thing. I, I taught, and all of our preachers are teaching, that this is the evidence of faith, that works is the evidence of faith. That's not true. That's not true at all. I'm going to give you an example real quick. I attended a camp meeting down uh, in, a, in a state down in the south one time. And this preacher got up and he preached. And here's what he said. He said, I went out in the uh, wilderness. And he said, uh, I saw some tracks. And he said, uh, they, were, they were bear tracks. Now he says, if they're bear tracks, what do you think I'm tracking? And everybody says, a bear. Then he said, I saw some rabbit tracks. He said, what do you think I'm tracking? Everybody said, well, a rabbit. He said, uh, then I saw some squirrel tracks. He said, what do you think I'm tracking? Everybody said, a squirrel. Now, do you get the point he was trying to make? So if you see somebody, the point he was making was, if you see somebody doing something wrong that you consider a believer should not be doing. What are you saying? They're not a believer. By whose standard? Get the point I'm trying to make? By whose standard? By your standard. See, you're, you're the one that's setting the standard. That's why God said, man looketh on the outward appearance, but God looketh on the heart. That's why we're not to judge before the time. See, the old saying, there's only two kinds of people, saved and lost. But that's not true. There's three kinds of people. They're saved and lost and carnal. I heard a preacher say here the other day, I used to accept the carnal Christian position, but I don't accept that anymore. Wait a minute. Wait just a minute. That's why you hear people say, if you see somebody that's not living the way you think they ought to live, well, she's not saved, or he's not saved. Oh, by whose standard? Now, let me show you something. In the final analysis, there's no difference between an Arminian and a Calvinist. You say, well, what do you mean by that? All right. An Arminian says, if you sin, you've lost your salvation. The Calvinist says, if you sin, you never did get salvation. So what's the difference? But let me show you something. The Arminian cannot tell you 
how far you have to sin before you lose it. Except they never sin enough to lose it. Have you noticed that? And the Calvinist, they never can tell you how much sin you have to sin before you never got it. Have you ever noticed that? See, I asked a preacher the other day, a Calvinist, I said, well, can a believer commit suicide? Is suicide self-murder? He said, well, I don't think they'd be in their right mind. Wait a minute. Can a person murder somebody and be in their right mind? I thought you believed in the security of the believer. See, that's, a, that's what a Judaizer was. Read the book of Galatians. O oh, foolish Galatians, who hath bewitched you? The Judaizers believed that you had to be circumcised and keep Moses' law in order to be saved. The Judaizers added to the law. They added to salvation. Now I want to show you. Look at verse 2 here. My brethren, count it all joy when ye fall into divers or different temptations. Now that's a strange statement. That's a strange statement. I thought the Lord's Prayer said, lead us not into temptation. And here James is saying, my brethren count it all joy when ye fall into different temptations. Maybe the Pope's right. He's changed the Lord's Prayer. Well, he, he can because he's the Pope. If you're the Pope, you can change the Lord's Prayer. He said instead of saying, lead us into temptation, Catholics will say, do not let us fall into temptation. Well, it's not what James said. James says, my brethren, count it all joy when ye fall into different temptations. Go back to 2 Corinthians chapter 11 for just a moment. Second Corinthians chapter 11 for just a moment. Look at Paul. Of the Jews, five times received I forty stripes, save one. Thrice was I beaten with rods. Once was I stoned. 
Twice I suffered shipwreck. A night and a day I have been in the deep. In journeyings often in perils of waters, in perils of robbers, in perils by mine own countrymen, in perils by the heathen, in perils in the city, in perils in the wilderness, in perils in the sea, in perils among false brethren, in weariness and painfulness, in watchings often, in hunger and thirst, in fasting often, in cold and nakedness, beside those things that are without that which cometh upon me daily, the care of all the churches. Who is weak and I am not weak? Who is offended and I burn not? If I must needs glory, I will glory of the things which concern mine infirmities. James said, count it all joy when we fall into different temptations. Look at 1 Peter chapter 4. Turn over there for a moment. Look at 1 Peter chapter 4. Beloved, think it not strange concerning the fiery trial which is to try you, as though some strange thing happened unto you. But rejoice, rejoice, inasmuch as ye are partakers of Christ's sufferings, that when his glory shall be revealed, well, when will his glory be revealed? When he comes in his kingdom. When his glory shall be revealed, ye may be glad also with exceeding joy. If ye be reproached for the name of Christ, happy are ye, for the spirit of glory and of God resteth upon you. On their part he is evil spoken of, but on your part he is glorified. But let none of you suffer as a murderer or as a thief or as an evildoer or as a See, I want you to see this. Or as a busybody, or in other men's matters. Yet if any man suffer as a Christian, let him not be ashamed, but let him glorify God on this behalf. For the time has come that judgment must begin at the house of God. And if it begin at us, what shall the end be of them that obey not the gospel of God? See? But let patience have her perfect work, that ye may be perfect and entire, wanting nothing. Look what it says. In Matthew 24, 13, he that endureth to the end shall be saved. What's that mean? He that endureth temptation. What's this word temptation mean? It's talking about testing. Testing. Now I want to, I want to explain something to you. Look at verse 13. Let no man say when he is tempted, I am tempted of God. For God cannot be tempted with evil, neither tempteth he any man. But every man is tempted when he is drawn away of his own lust and enticed. Then when lust hath conceived, it bringeth forth sin. And sin, when it is finished, bringeth forth death. Do not err, my beloved brethren. Now let me show you. I want to show you something here. There's two kinds of temptation dealing. There's two different temptations here. Now, if I wanted to get into the Greek, I could get into Greek here. I, I know enough about the old language. And I could get into that with you, but I'm not going to get into that with you. I'm going to explain it to you. This first temptation is talking about testing. Like giving a test. 
Lead us not into temptation. In the garden, Jesus said, Not my will, but thine be done. Matthew 4. The Spirit led Jesus into the wilderness to be tested, to be tempted of the devil. And after 40 days and 40 nights, he fasted. He fasted for 40 days and 40 nights. And afterward, he hungered. And Satan came to him and said, See these stones. Make bread out of these stones. Jesus, God said to Abraham, Take thine son, thine only son Isaac, into a mountain that I will show you and offer him as a sacrifice. God didn't take a prostitute and set her before Abraham. Did you see the difference? God doesn't tempt people with sin, with evil. He allows people to be tested. Let me show you something. There's the football field out there. The Colts. have a 53-man roster. They've got 100 men on contract. But there's only going to be 53 men that's going to make that team. But they've got a gymnasium, a workout room, Men are going to go into that room and they're going to work. And they're going to work with weights. And they're going to go in there and be tested. And they've got a practice field. And it's a joy for them to go in to be tested. They love it. They love it. They love that place. They love it. They love to go in there and work out. It's a moral gymnasium. They love to go in there. You can't get them out. They can't, you can't get them out for their family. You can't hardly get them out to eat. They love to go in there because there's only going to be 53 men to go out of there and to go into that team to go into that season to be on the team. There's going to only be 53. My friend, let me tell you something. Go back in that Old Testament. There were only a few mighty men that went into the cave of Dulam with David that went into the kingdom when he set up his kingdom, read it. There were only a few mighty men. And one day when Jesus goes into his kingdom, there's only going to be a few mighty men and women that go into that kingdom with him because with all joy they fell into temptation. They went into that moral gymnasium and they beat their body as Paul said in 1 Corinthians 9 I beat my body 
and brought it into subjection that after I preached to others that I should not be a castaway. That's what they're talking about. But this temptation in verse 13 is a different type of temptation. That's the kind of temptation that God would never put before us. It's that temptation of the flesh. Oh, my friends, the Bible says, no temptation hath overtaken you, but such as is common to man. And God will, with the temptation, make a way of escape that no man will ever be able to say, God failed me. God failed me. Listen to me. Let no man say when he is tempted, I'm tempted of God. God cannot be tempted with evil. Neither tempted he any man. But every man is tempted when he is drawn away of his own lust and enticed. Then when he has been conceived, hath conceived, It bringeth forth sin and sin. When that football player goes into that moral gymnasium, when he goes into that gymnasium to lift weights, there's there's no sin to that. There's no sin to be tested. There's no sin. There's no sin in the test. But oh, this is different. When that evil thought comes into your mind, someone says, I can't help if the buzzards fly over my head. But to let them build a nest in your hair, now that's different. Of course, when you don't have any hair like Andy back there, they can't build a, can't build a nest. Amen, Brother Andy. Oh, you understand what I'm talking about. My friend, you can't help. You see, somebody says, I'm not going to think any evil thoughts. That's a joke. The very minute you say, I'm not going to think an evil thought, the evil thought will come into your mind. But you know what you do? Wherewith shall a young man cleanse himself? By taking thought thereto the word of God. That's where the armor of God comes in. The whole armor of God. I'll take the shield of faith, the shield of faith, that I may withstand all of the fiery darts of the wicked one. Oh, my friends, listen to me. Listen to me. There it is. That every man is tempted when he is drawn away of his own lust and enticed. The very minute that evil thought comes, counter it with the word of God. Amen. He's drawn away of his own lust and enticed. Then when lust hath conceived, there it is. When lust hath conceived, it bringeth forth sin. And sin, when it is finished, bringeth forth death. In 1 John 5, 16, there is a sin and a death. I don't say that you should pray for it, but there is a sin unto death. Oh, listen to me. What does the Bible say? Oh, tribulation worketh patience. Tribulation worketh patience. Knowing that tribulation worketh patience. And patience experience. Because when they go into that moral gymnasium, they know that if they're patient and stay there long enough, The experience worketh hope, and hope maketh not ashamed. And then when it comes time to stand before those coaches, that they won't be ashamed, 
and they'll be chosen to be on the team. The Bible says that if we're not ashamed of him, he won't be ashamed of us when we stand before him when he comes in to his kingdom. And then in verse 17 it says, Every good gift and perfect gift is from above and cometh down from the Father of lights with whom is no variableness, neither shadow of turning. And then it says, Oh, my friends, listen to me. In, in, in verse 13, let me, begin, let, me begin, let me read in verse 13. Let no man say uh, when he is tempted. I'm sorry. Verse 18, of his own will begat he us with the word of truth that we should be a kind of first fruits of his creatures. Now, we don't have time to get into this, but just briefly, I'm going to touch on this because we're going to be teaching on this later. Look at Romans 8 real quick. I just want to touch on this this morning because we're going to be dealing with this more later. Look at Romans 8. I want you to see this firstborn sons. I'm just going to touch on this this morning. Look at Romans 8 real quick. Look at Romans 8. I want you to see the real meaning of predestination. Look at Romans 8, verse 29. For whom he did foreknow, he did predestinate to be conformed to the image of his son, that he might be the firstborn among many brethren. This, this isn't talking about being lost. Lost people among many brethren. More of whom he did predestinate than he also called. See? It says many are called, but few are chosen. See? And whom he called, then he also justified. And whom he justified, then he also glorified. See? Well, glorified when? When he comes into his kingdom. What shall we say then to these things? If God be for us, who can be against us? All right. That he may be the firstborn among many brethren. All right, go back now to James chapter 1 again. Verse 18, that we should be a kind of first fruits of his creatures. He's looking for firstborn sons. Wherefore, my beloved brethren, let every man be swift to hear, slow to speak, slow to wrath, for the wrath of man worketh not the righteousness of God. Wherefore, lay apart all filthiness, superfluity, if naughtiness, receive with meekness the engrafted word which is able to save your souls. Now, wait a minute. Now, wait a minute. Save your souls. I thought you were already thought your souls were already saved. See the point I'm trying to make? Mm-hmm. I thought your souls were already saved. This is talking about a future salvation. And how are you going to save your souls? By your patience. By not being wrathful. By laying aside filthiness and superfluity and naughtiness and receive the meekness of the engrafted word which is able to save your souls. We're talking about a salvation that is different than justification. Do you see that? Is that a problem? Does anyone have a problem with what I'm showing you? This is future. That's contingent. That's 
that's qualifiable. That's yet future that's based on actions that has to be taken, that has to be earned. It's not something by faith that's received as a gift. It's a reward for good works. Be ye doers of the word. We're talking about something that you have to do. It's something that's earned. We're not talking about justification by faith. We're talking about justification by works. And we're going to see that in chapter 2. That that's what James is talking about in chapter 2 when he says, show me your faith without your works and I'm going to show you my faith by my works. This is what he's talking about. Be ye doers of the word and not hearers only, deceiving your own selves. For if any be a hearer of the word and not a doer, he is liking unto a man beholding the natural face in a glass, for he beholdeth himself and goeth his way, and straightway forgetteth what manner of man he was. In other words, he forgets that he's been justified by faith. But whoso looketh into the perfect law of liberty and continueth therein, he being not a forgetful hearer, but a doer of the work, this man shall be blessed in his deed. If any man among you seem to be religious and bridleth not his tongue, but deceiveth his own heart, this man's religion is vain. Pure religion and undefiled before God and the Father is this. To win souls. No, it doesn't say that. To visit the fatherless and widows in their affliction and to keep himself unspotted from the world. That's why John said, Love not the world, neither the things that are in the world. For if any man love the world, the love of the Father is not in him. Doesn't say that he's not saved. It says the love of the Father is not in him. Jesus said, if you love me, keep my commandments. Now, you can see how the whole church has gotten off base. In fact, I know two men, one's dead, one's still living, who actually has said that the book of James doesn't even belong in the canon. Because they despised the book of James so bad because it's such an indictment. It's such an indictment. One of the greatest preachers that ever lived, I heard him on the radio the other day. He's dead, but his sermons are still being played on the radio. And he, he, was, he was preaching on James 2. And he said, this is the evidence of justification. That by our works, we will give evidence that we're justified. My friend, let me tell you, many people are saved 
that bear no fruit. The fig tree that Jesus cursed, it had no fruit, but it was still a fig tree. There are people that get married that never have children. There are people that get married that never consummate their marriage, but they're still married. The Bible says they, that they were unfruitful. Oh, they were unfruitful. I'm going to close with this. Go to, go to John 15, and then we'll close. Look at John 15. See, we couldn't understand some of these scriptures because we didn't understand this, this teaching. We just didn't understand these scriptures. We just, we just ignored them. We didn't understand them. We didn't know what to do with them. Look at John 15. Jesus said, John 15, beginning with verse 1. Jesus said, I am the true vine, and my Father is the husband. Every branch in me that beareth not fruit, he taketh away. And every branch that beareth fruit, he purgeth it, that it may bring forth more fruit. Now I'll just stop right there. I won't go any farther. It says he taketh away, but it's still fruit. It's still fruit. It's still fruit. See? See? Verse 4, Abide in me, and I in you, as the branch cannot bear fruit of itself, except it abide in the vine. No more can ye, except ye abide in me. If we don't abide in him, we cannot bear fruit. It'd be like if you had a vacuum sweeper. If you don't plug it in, it's not going to work. You can have it, but it's not going to work. See? Our Father, we thank you for the opportunity of being able to come here today and being able to preach the Word of God. My, what a privilege. Few pulpits on this earth that we could stand and preach what we've preached here today. There's very few that would, would even allow us to. That would, that would even accept the Word. It would even uh, give us an opportunity we want to thank you for the privilege of being here and preaching the word of God today. Oh, that we may be faithful, that we may receive a crown of life, that we may ever be faithful to you. For Jesus' sake we pray. Amen.